I'm going to talk about um, a very broad overview of the China-Africa relationship. As you probably gather from my uh, background, I'm a specialist in Africa. Uh, I'm not a sinologist. I don't speak Mandarin. I've spent uh, a lot of time traveling in China. So I, I do know the, uh, the country a bit, but uh, I'm not a sinologist. I'm an Africanist. So I look at this from a somewhat different perspective, perhaps, than, than some of those who have spoken with you who are true sinologists. I want to start with what I consider to be uh, China's five hard interests in Africa. And by a hard interest, uh, my definition may be a little bit different than that which you normally hear from governments, including the American government. Uh, it's what, in this case, China wants from Africa. Not what it can do for Africa, what it wants from Africa. And if I were doing this for the U.S. interests, I would have a very similar presentation. And I would argue that China has five things that it wants um, from Africa. The first is access to raw materials. Uh, China imports um, all of Africa's uh, exports to, uh, to China consist primarily of raw materials, about 85% of everything that goes out of Africa to China is some form of a raw material, usually oil or minerals. Now, China gets about 22% of its oil from Africa right now, uh, but it gets even larger percentages of cobalt and tantalum and manganese, uh, critical raw materials for its industrial um, sector. <coughs> this helps sustain China's economy, and that, in turn, helps keep the Communist Party in power. And as we heard this morning, that's really what it's all about, uh, is the Communist Party. In fact, I will try to, uh, the, the presentation this morning led very well into some of the remarks that I will make in terms of United Front activity, in this case in Africa, but it works pretty much the same way in the Middle East and Africa, and probably around the world for that matter. The second interest that um, China has in Africa is to increase its exports to Africa. Why is that an interest? Very simple. It makes money, foreign exchange. Uh, and that's what you want from the continent, is to make money from it. Africa has well over one billion people. It has increasing numbers of uh, consumers with expendable income who have money to spend. China wants to take advantage of that. Uh, so as a result, uh, Africa is becoming a more attractive uh, uh, market, uh, export market for China, and also for selling services, which China is also increasing uh, in Africa, and particularly the winning of contracts for these large infrastructure projects that I suspect you've heard about uh, this week. The third interest that China has in Africa is uh, support, political support from as many African countries as possible. There are 54 countries uh, in Africa. Uh, that is more than one quarter of the membership of the United Nations. Now, I'm not suggesting they all vote as a bloc. They don't. But there is a tendency to vote along similar lines. And China has been very good at cultivating the uh, countries in Africa when it comes to votes in the United Nations or other organizations where you have African participation, like the World Trade Organization or any organization that has African participation dealing with human rights. Because then it often becomes a question of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, where they're protecting each other's poor human rights practices. Uh, the fourth interest that, uh, that China has on the continent is to basically eliminate the diplomatic representation of Taiwan. And China has almost uh, succeeded in doing that. Uh, there, are to, there is today only one African country, Swaziland, a little tiny country in the southern part of the continent, that still recognizes um, Taiwan. The other 43 now recognize Beijing. Uh, Africa was a continent of a lot of flipping back and forth between Taipei and Beijing. Uh, there are several countries in Africa that have flipped three different times, going one way or the other, depending upon which country that is, uh, Taiwan or, or China, offered the best uh, incentive package, uh, using a euphemism there. Uh, one could argue it's a little, really not much more than bribery. But in any event, um, it's, it's a, a debate that is largely over with now because virtually all the countries 
now recognized Beijing. The most recent one to switch was Burkina Faso, and that was earlier this year. The fifth and last interest that China has uh, in Africa is to minimize the impact of a whole series of negative things that could happen to Chinese interests, uh, particularly those in Africa. That is, the Chinese presence in Africa. We heard this morning that it's in excess of one billion. It's an estimate, but it's probably as good an estimate as we have. Might be a little bit more than that. No one knows for sure, and it's a constantly fluctuating number in any event. But the point is that there is a sizable community in Africa, and there are even more important business interests there. And as time goes on, these interests come under a certain threats uh, on the continent, and occasionally even in China itself. Uh, terrorism, for example, terrorist attacks on the Chinese community and Chinese interests. Uh, piracy uh, in the, the Gulf of uh, Aden, or in, the, in the, uh, the Gulf of Guinea on the western side of Africa. Uh, narcotics trafficking, uh, some of which is now actually taking place uh, in China, coming through the, the African diaspora in China. Uh, money laundering, uh, international crime, all kinds of things that can have negative impacts upon your interests. China wants those minimized or ideally eliminated. Uh, let me move now to uh, how China goes about doing a lot of these uh, activities in Africa. And the one area that I would like to highlight is the, is the nature of the government-to-government -government relationship. China has perfected this to a high art form. Frankly, it does a much better job at it than the United States, for example, does. But that's due in large part to the nature of the, of the government of China uh, and how it operates as compared to how a, a democratic regime like the United States operates. Uh, China now has diplomatic ties with 53 of the 54 countries in Africa. It has an embassy in every single one of those countries, without exception. By contrast, the United States has diplomatic ties with all 54 countries in Africa, but we only have an embassy in 49 because we can't afford to have an embassy in every country in Africa, so we choose not to have embassies in some of the smaller countries. Uh, all 53 African countries that recognize Beijing have an embassy in Beijing, again without exception. China operates with large numbers of what I call high-level visits going both directions, Chinese to Africa, Africans to China. Uh, former Chinese President Hu Jintao visited Africa on four different occasions, multiple countries on four different occasions. President Xi Jinping uh, made his first overseas visit anywhere in the world after taking uh, the presidency went first immediately to Russia, but then went from Russia directly to Africa uh, in order to highlight the importance that China attaches to the relationship with Africa. And Xi Jinping has been back to Africa twice since then. Uh, most recently, um, last, uh, actually, you know, last month, uh, when he was attending the, um, the FOCAC meeting, the, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation meeting in uh, uh, in South Africa. Uh, every, more important perhaps, every year since 1991, the Chinese foreign minister has made his first overseas visit anywhere in the world to an African country. Since 1991, a long period of time, which means that the foreign minister, usually in January, maybe February, goes to Africa, and then after that goes to other parts of the world. But that is not by accident. That is to send a message that we, the Chinese leadership, uh, want to pay attention to Africa. And one way we can do that is to send our foreign minister there, again, usually to multiple countries, uh, every year since 1991. Uh, China also has a record of sending Communist Party officials regularly to Africa. They don't get as much attention in the media, but their visits are every bit as important as those of um, the president and the prime, the prime ministers and the, the senior ministers of the country. Um, and it gives China 
a sort of a whole other bite at the apple, if you will, uh, as compared to, say, the United States or Western governments where the political parties don't serve that function. Republican Party officials and Democratic Party officials don't, don't make these kinds of high-level visits around the world. Now, they may go as individual senators or representatives, but they, they don't go as a party representative, and they're normally not representing the United States executive branch when they do that kind of thing. They're representing their, the commercial interests of, of their state or their the committee that they serve on. It's a very different arrangement. There's a constant parade of senior African civilian and military leaders um, to China. They're, they're frequently invited to come, much more frequently than is the case of the United States. In the year 2000, China and the African countries created what is called the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. This is an organization that's referred to as FOCAC, F-O-C-A-C. Uh, this is an organization which is an effort to coordinate the relationship between the 53 countries in Africa that recognize Beijing uh, and, uh, and China itself. Uh, obviously, when you have this many countries, it's not easy to, to have a more coordinated policy towards that continent. Um, let me turn to trade. Th this is an area where the China-Africa relationship excels China actually became Africa's largest trading partner in 2009, passing the United States. The United States has now dropped to number four on the list. Uh, our, the U.S. relationship with Africa has been in sort of a state of, of decline in recent years. Uh, Africa accounts for less than 5% of China's global trade, so it's not a, it's not a huge percentage. Of, uh, of China's trade. That's because China is such a major trading power today. On the other hand, it accounts for about 15% of Africa's global trade. Now, this simply means that um, China trades about three times more than all of Africa combined, so you have a, a difference here of 5% versus 15%. There are huge disparities in the relationship in the trade relationship between China and individual African countries. Uh, there are some 10 African oil and mineral exporting countries that had trade surpluses with China in 2016. Now ideally you would like to have a trade surplus with another country if you possibly can. That's one of the big arguments today between China and U.S. on, on trade issues. We have an enormous deficit with China. Uh, but there are 42 African countries that uh, had trade deficits with China, most of them very large trade deficits, in 2016. So while 10 African countries are doing just fine because they have a lot of oil or minerals, 42 African countries are not doing so well when it comes to the trade relationship with China. And perhaps a more telling figure on all of this is that just two African countries, two, account for more than half of all of Africa's exports to China in 2016. And they are South Africa, which has a lot of minerals, and Angola, which has a lot of oil. So that's two out of 54 countries in Africa. Most Chinese exports to Africa are high-value manufactured goods, uh, whereas most uh, African exports to China, as I indicated, are, are raw materials. This uh, high-value manufactured goods consist primarily of uh, machinery, electronic equipment, um, and, uh, and transportation equipment. Turning to investment, foreign direct investment, First off, it's important to understand that we don't have really good numbers to work with here. There's a certain amount of guesswork that's going on. And if you use China's official statistics on the amount of foreign direct investment in Africa, I would argue they understate the actual amount, which is a little surprising. You would think that China would want to overstate the amount of foreign direct investment in Africa. But it, in my view, they understate the numbers because of the manner in which they they uh, calculate the figures, which is essentially uh, simply to report or to use uh, 
for, for uh, public purposes, only those numbers that are reported to the government by the, um, the Chinese companies, both state-owned companies and private companies. And a lot of these numbers don't get reported, particularly those that go through tax havens like the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands. They don't get picked up by the Chinese government. So the, the figure that the government of China uses, which is uh, the most recent one, is, goes back a couple of years, is $32 billion of foreign direct investment in Africa, uh, I would argue is uh, significantly understates the, the actual number. Uh, there's another organization that tries to track Chinese FDI going to Africa, and it puts the number at about $83 billion. That's probably a lot closer to the actual amount than the official Chinese figure. In terms of annual investment flows from China to Africa, the number that's used these days, and I think it's probably pretty close, is about $3 billion annually, which is actually about the same amount coming from the United States to Africa today. Now, both China and Africa and, uh, and the US are about $3 billion of annual investment flows to the continent. In 2014, uh, Chinese FDI to Africa was only 7% of the global FDI going to Africa. So again, it's important to put China in perspective. Sometimes when you read about uh, the China-Africa relationship in the press, you have the impression that gee, China is doing everything and no one else is doing anything. It's just not true. Uh, if, you, if you take into account what all the European countries uh, uh, the North American countries, in addition to the rest of the world, are doing uh, FDI 7% of the global amount going into Africa. Not insignificant, but not what you would think by reading a lot of the press coverage. Uh, Western investment in Africa is far larger than Chinese investment, in part because Western countries started a lot earlier. I'm talking about investment stock here that has built up over the years. Uh, those countries that uh, have received most of the Chinese uh, investment are South Africa, Zambia, Nigeria, Algeria, Angola, and Sudan. And why those countries? Well, it's pretty simple. They have oil and they have minerals. Now, turning to Chinese aid to, um, to Africa. Again, we have a little numbers problem because China treats foreign aid as a state secret. Uh, they do not release numbers for the amount of aid going to individual African countries. Um, in fact, they technically they don't even release the amount of aid going to all of Africa. They will give a global, occasionally will give a global aid figure, and then they give a percentage of how much of that global aid went to Africa. The last time they did this, it was 52%. Uh, so you can sort of come up with a, a rough figure for all of Africa. You cannot come up with good figures for individual African countries. Now, another problem is that China does not use the same definition of aid as the OECD does. So when you start comparing Chinese numbers with Western numbers, you might be comparing apples and oranges because their definitions are different. They're not hugely different, but they're different, and you have to be careful in making comparisons. Until 2018, this year, there was no central Chinese aid agency, and that has further compli uh, complicated the compilation of aid data uh, in China. One of the reasons they don't give out good figures is they never had a central aid agency in order to put the figures together. Uh, so you can't blame them too much for, um, for not releasing figures, although I think there are other reasons why they probably have not uh, given bilateral figures out. Uh, the Ministry of Commerce has traditionally controlled um, most of China's aid going to Africa, in fact, going anywhere in the world for that matter. And you might be thinking, gee, Ministry of Commerce, charge of aid, isn't that kind of strange? Well, not in the Chinese concept of things. It makes good sense, good business sense that the <coughs> Ministry of Commerce would be in charge of, of, of providing the aid. Um, now, China did announce this year, earlier this year, that it would create a new central aid bureau under the state council and it, that it would uh, assume the responsibilities that did uh, previously exist in the Ministry of Commerce 
and in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So China is right now in the process of creating an aid agency. Most of China's aid consists of concessionary loans. Uh, there are cash grants and there are some uh, in-kind grants like the, uh, the offering of uh, 1,000 vehicles or 5,000 computers or whatever would be an in-kind grant. Uh, China also has a pretty good record on debt cancellation uh, going back over the years. Uh, China's OECD equivalent aid in Africa in recent years is estimated to be about $2.5 billion annually. Now, as I say, there, there are no hard numbers out there uh, from the government of China uh, on this aid, so we're doing a little bit of guesswork here. But two and a half billion dollars seems to be the agreed upon amount by most people who look at this uh, issue uh, carefully. Uh, China likes to make uh, the point that there is no uh, political conditionality attached to its aid, uh, which, with the exception of the One China Principle, of course, which is reasonable enough if a country is not going to recognize you diplomatically, why would you be giving it aid? But that is a political condition of sorts. Uh, on the other hand, the aid is almost always tied to Chinese companies and Chinese materials. So there are there is economic conditionality. There is not political conditionality. Uh, and often you have a percentage of Chinese labor that is attached to the infrastructure projects. In other words, you, you take a Chinese concessionary loan to build a dam or a port. Uh, not only do you have to have that done with a Chinese company using largely Chinese materials, but in the contract agreement there will usually be a provision that you also have to allow 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 percent Chinese labor to build that project. And that sometimes rubs uh, raw against African feelings where they think there are enough Africans available to do the work and they wonder why so many Chinese have to come in and help out the project. Uh, on the issue of, of political conditionality, since it, this goes back to the issue this morning, which uh, I, I found to be a particularly useful part of the presentation, talking about the, the, the Muslim minority populations in, uh, in Western China, and particularly the Uyghurs in Western China, uh, this is clearly an internal Chinese issue. And, the, the Chinese, of course, do not want any discussion outside of their borders by, by African governments, certainly, of their internal problems or issues. But it's interesting to me that in the last 20 or 30 years, there is not a single, not a single African leader who has made any mention whatsoever of the, the problems, uh, the issues in Xinjiang province, and particularly those facing the Uyghurs. These re-education institutes that uh, were discussed this morning, uh, which are a serious issue in, in Xinjiang province, are simply not talked about by African leaders. Now, you can argue, well, why should they? It's a long ways away. Why do we care about it? Uh, the, the problem is that many African governments are Muslim governments. They are either overwhelmingly Muslim in North Africa, much of the Sahel zone, or you have very, very large Muslim minorities. And yet, this is just the topic you don't touch at the governmental level. Maybe at the academic level there will be some discussion about it. Uh, but I've just uh, come back from uh, three weeks traveling in five African countries, and we, uh, we raised this issue with some of our Muslim friends in Africa, and they basically sort of shake their heads and say, well, we just don't talk about it. It's just not an issue. And one wonders whether this will continue to be the case uh, as we move into the future. Um, by contrast, of course, Western countries do have economic or do have political conditionality attached to a lot of their aid. If an African government uh, is, has a very poor human rights record, uh, is not performing well democratically, it's, although we're not always consistent about it, I must confess, uh, but we often do uh, criticize um, the African government, impose conditionality, and uh, the African governments obviously don't like that. So in a sense, the, the government of China has a real advantage here. By refusing to talk about these issues, human rights, democratization, whereas the Western governments, and particularly the United States, do raise this as an issue, 
uh, we have sort of a, a hand tied behind our back because we're, we're going in and, and uh, causing irritation with African governments right from the, the get-go. And the African governments are not shy about telling us that. Um, there, as one Chinese official told me a number of years ago in one of my earlier visits to, uh, to China, and he was saying this somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but not entirely, and this is a direct quotation, no African leader has ever asked us to attach conditions to our, to our aid. Uh, and, of course, being a Chinese official, uh, uh, he, he's, he's, I'm sure he's correct on that. Uh, obviously, no African official would ever ask them to attach conditions to their aid. But he wanted to uh, tweak, uh, tweak me, and, and that was the comment that he made. Um, a lot of what China is doing in Africa today in terms of aid, I would describe as being very attractive commercial bank loans, but they don't really qualify as aid. And that, that applies to most of these big infrastructure projects. Keep in mind, these are loans. The African government is supposed to repay all of this money. Now, the concessionary terms may be such that the concessionary component might, I underscore might, uh, uh, comply with conditions for, for OECD-type aid. Uh, if it's an interest-free loan, and there are interest-free loans from China, uh, that component of the, of the uh, proposal would be aid, that is the interest-free part of it. But still, it's a loan. It's got to be repaid. Uh, the United States does not do loans any longer, and it's aid program. Everything we do is, is grant. We learned a long time ago that you do loans to poorer countries, you're probably not going to get repaid anyway, so you might as well just uh, do grants and uh, hope for the best rather than, than do, um, do loans. Um, let me turn to the issue of soft power. In another area where China is ramping up its activities in Africa. You know, there was some discussion of this this morning with the Confucius Institutes. But between 2012 and 2016, some 40,000 African students received full scholarships to study in China. Full scholarships. Now, the U.S. has no comparable program to that. We have a Fulbright program. You know, some universities have very small scholarship programs for African students. But there is no way that the United States can compete uh, with China uh, in terms of scholarships. Uh, traditionally, we have had more students from Africa in the United States than China has, but these are students who come on their own. They uh, Either their family pays their way or they work hard in the United States or whatever. But even this has changed. So in the last couple of years, there are more African students in China than there are in the United States. It's a very new development. This is in, in terms of total numbers uh, currently here today. In fact, there are more uh, students in, uh, in China, African students in China, than there are in the United Kingdom. The only country that has more African students today in China is France. And it does have significantly more, interestingly, because you do have this strong connection between Francophone, Africa, and France. But um, it's, it's France, uh, China, United Kingdom and United States at about the same level, and then after that, I don't know where they're, they're primarily concentrated. Since 1963, China has had a, uh, a program of sending medical personnel to Africa, and the, the numbers over the years have now totaled well over 18,000 medi Chinese medical personnel who go to Africa in teams. Uh, coming from the same province, it's a twinning relationship of a particular uh, Chinese province with one or more African countries. And they have now served in 51 different African countries and it's been a very successful program. Uh, they get high praise from the Africans and uh, this is a program that continues up to the present day. On the other hand, China tried to institute a, a program about 10 years ago that they called the Youth Volunteer Program it actually came out of the Youth League of the Communist Party. It's probably part of the, uh, of, of the front effort. And it looked a little bit like the American Peace Corps program. In fact, it, it was similar to the American Peace Corps program. 
Uh, at the height of the program, they never had more than 400 volunteers serving in Africa. But that program mysteriously ended uh, four or five years ago, and apparently because it was not considered to have been a, a successful program. So not everything that China does in this area necessarily works or is a success. They, they try these, some of these things, and if they don't work, they just quietly disappear. Uh, this is one that did, although who knows, they may uh, take another look at it and try to revive it. China has been very active in the media sector in, um, in Africa. Uh, Xinhua, the official Chinese news service, has more than 20 bureaus in Africa. It has regional centers in Cairo and Nairobi. Uh, it competes very effectively with Reuters, Agence France Presse, Bloomberg, all the other Western news services. Uh, China Radio International, known as CRI, transmits in Swahili, Hausa, Arabic, Portuguese, French, and English. It's expanding its efforts in Africa. Uh, China Central Television has a production center in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, it broadcasts English language African news all over the continent. The Communist Party of China arranges tours in China for African journalists. I think that's kind of a strange organization for, for dealing with journalists. Well, not, not so when you stop to think about it. Uh, this is an effort to try to uh, uh, encourage uh, African journalists to look at China in a much more favorable light. And who better to do that than the Communist Party? Uh, there are 48 Confucius Institutes on African University campuses and 23 Confucius classrooms in African high schools. Now, if you think about it, that's not a lot. I indicated earlier, 54 countries in Africa, if there are only 48 institutes, that means you don't even have one in every country. In a country like South Africa and Kenya, we'll have three or maybe four Confucius Institutes, so there will be a number of African countries with no institute. And 23 Confucius classrooms is a pretty paltry number. But the numbers are growing. Every, uh, every year when I look at the new uh, figures on the Hanban um, website, which is the official website for the Confucius Institutes, the number is growing. Uh, these uh, institutes teach Chinese language, history, and education in 35 different uh, African countries. Uh, on the military security side, China got involved initially in, um, on the continent in supporting African liberation movements, built up a lot of goodwill because of that. Uh, Africa is actually a relatively low security priority for, um, for China and, and the grand scheme of things. Obviously, the Chinese periphery is far more important uh, from a security point of view. And even the, the, Western, the major Western powers are more important for, for China's security interests than are the countries of Africa. But China does rely increasingly upon natural resources coming from Africa, and this has security implications. And China has a security link with every African country with which it has diplomatic relations. In some cases, it's nothing more than uh, military to military visits at a high level. Uh, China has become a growing provider of both conventional weapons to uh, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, much more so than North Africa, uh, and an even larger provider of small arms and light weapons, the kinds of things that one person can, can carry. Uh, and it's doing this because it's selling these products. And it's selling them because that makes money. It's just that simple. Any African government that can pay, gets. Uh, there are no distinctions made. The US is a little fussier in terms of where it will allow its weaponry to be sold. Uh, China doesn't really care. If you are an African government, you are legitimate. End of story. Uh, the fact that some of these African governments then transfer the weapons to their favorite rebel group in a neighboring country well, China doesn't like that, but there's nothing that China tries to, to do to stop it because they don't have the mechanisms in place to monitor what happens to the weapons once they go to another country. Uh, China is, I think it's safe to say that China is today the single largest provider of both conventional weapons, that is bigger pieces of equipment, and small arms and light weapons than any other country in the world. Please. Um, does it seem like they're beginning to reshape? policy or shifting as they become more and more involved? I'm sorry, does it seem as though they are? Maybe shifting their like, kind of lack of interest in what happens to weapons afterwards as they become increasingly invested. Oh, yeah, 
the question is, uh, and I think you're you're suggesting that as they, uh, as the Chinese themselves come under attack, are they are they a little more concerned about what happens to these weapons? Is that, is that the gist of where you're? Yeah, or that as more and more of them are getting involved in these countries, that they would become more concerned about. Yeah, I, I think they are becoming more concerned as these weapons show up in conflict zones, and they're clearly showing up in the conflict zones. You're finding uh, the UN is finding them now, and you can document serial numbers so we know that they're coming from China. Uh, in uh, eastern Congo, uh, Somalia, um, you know, southern in, in Sudan, in the conflict in Sudan, the weapons are showing up regularly in these areas. And there have even been a few cases where the weapons have been used by a group against Chinese interests. And this is, uh, this is causing China to, to try to figure out ways how they can clamp down on better restrictions for, for dealing with the sale of weapons. But they haven't figured this one out. In fact, no one's really figured it out, quite honestly. Uh, with small arms and light weapons, they're so fungible. They're all over the continent of Africa now. Uh, I've been to weapons markets in Somalia where you could, you could buy everything from an anti-tank missile to an AK-47 if you had money in your back pocket. Uh, and there were absolutely zero restrictions on it. Uh, and you know, huge, huge fields of equipment from every conceivable country in the world. Uh, so once these things are out there, there's almost no stopping them. And Afri most African governments are not in a position to crack down either. In fact, the African governments are often the source of the problem because they're releasing them from their stocks to, uh, to uh, groups that are hostile to their uh, enemies. So it's, a, it's a serious problem, but I, I think it is fair to say that China would like to crack down, they'd like to deal with this more effectively, they just haven't figured out how to do it. And as, well that leads into my next point, which is as the, the attacks increase on, on Chinese nationals in Africa, there obviously are growing concerns by the government of China as to how do you protect your own citizens and interests on the continent. Uh, China has had cases where oil and construction company personnel have uh, been killed and kidnapped in Sudan. China had to evacuate 36,000 Chinese from Libya after the fall of Gaddafi in 2011 because the country just, uh, the govern governance just disintegrated in the country. Uh, after it removed all Chinese from the country and they stayed away for a year or so, the situation got a little bit better in Libya. The Chinese started to return again, uh, only to find that in 2014 they had to evacuate another thousand Chinese from Libya, those who had come back after things got better, because the situation deteriorated again. Uh, in 2014, some 10 Chinese construction workers uh, were kidnapped in Cameroon by Boko Haram. In 2015, three senior Chinese managers were killed during a terrorist attack on the Radisson Blue Hotel in Bamako, Mali, where you have uh, terrorist activity going on. In 2016, two Chinese peacekeepers with the UN mission in South Sudan were killed and two were seriously injured in an attack upon the uh, UN uh, peacekeeping base uh, near Juba in the capital of South Sudan. And since 2008, China has had uh, two frigates and a supply ship assigned to the anti-piracy operation in the Gulf of Aden in order to help ward off attacks on Chinese ships and Chinese crews in that area. Uh, China is finding out that it's being subjected to the same kinds of attacks and problems and challenges that every other country in the world has experienced in, um, in and near Africa. Uh, China does contribute the largest number of peacekeepers to the UN peacekeeping missions in Africa of all five members, permanent members of the UN Security Council. Today it's a total of about 2,100 troops, staff officers, and experts to five of the seven UN peacekeeping operations in Africa. Uh, more than any other, uh, as I say, it's more than any other permanent uh, UN Security Council member, but it's far fewer than contributions from countries like Ethiopia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Rwanda. Uh, China is the second largest contributor financially to UN peacekeeping operations globally. Uh, 
behind the United States, which provides about 28% uh, of the budget. China provides about 10% of the budget. And China's performance, in, in all fairness, has been widely praised in, um, in the UN peacekeeping operations. Uh, China has recently opened its first military base outside of China in the little country of Djibouti and uh, the Horn of Africa. China has a long-standing policy of, quote, no foreign military bases. That has been part of the policy since 1949. So in order to get around uh, this issue of a foreign military base in Djibouti, they just call it something else. They call it a naval support facility. So no, we don't have any military bases. Uh, now they have facilities there that may eventually take as many as 10,000 troops. Uh, the number is far below that at the moment. Uh, but they're putting in a helicopter landing strip. Uh, they have Ks uh, available for their ships to come in. They do live fire exercises with their military personnel there. But it's not a base. It's a military. It's a naval support facility. Thank you. Uh, you're going to have a lot more naval support facilities around the world in the coming years, I would wager to guess. Uh, what are some of the challenges and problems that, um, that China faces in Africa? I've alluded to some of them already, but just to summarize a bit. Uh, one, uh, African civil society, opposition political parties, and independent labor unions are very skeptical of what China is doing in Africa. Well, not surprising. How strong is civil society, independent labor unions, and opposition political parties in China? Uh, they either don't exist or they're very weak. Um, so you're going to encounter issues um, with these kinds of groups, which in some African countries are very, very strong. It varies enormously from one country to another. Some Africans and, and organized groups um, are critical of China's uh, unwillingness to encourage better human rights and democratic governance. And they're, these are the groups that tend to be supportive of what the West is doing in, uh, in Africa. Uh, Chinese and Western arms, I, I, I to be fair here, one must point out that the West is probably equally guilty, but these arms do end up in conflict zones in Africa. Uh, China's policy is to keep them out, but as I suggested, it's very, very hard to do that. There's a concern that large Chinese loans may undercut efforts by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to encourage good governance in Africa, and this is becoming a growing problem as the debt burden seems to be growing again in many African governments. Some Chinese companies have a poor record on um, worker safety and following local labor laws. Again, this is not something that's encouraged by the government of China, but if you're a Chinese company and you're simply out there to make money, you're going to do whatever you have to do to make the most money that you can. And if that means um, ignoring local labor laws or in, in ignoring environmental practices, um, uh, you're probably going to do that if it will maximize your profit. And Chinese companies do have a, not a very good record on that score. The counterfeit and adulterated products that we some the Chinese sometimes see in China, and we certainly have seen from time to time in the United States, are obviously a problem in a place like Africa, where you do not have organizations like the Food and Drug Administration that can monitor this stuff and prevent it from circulating for very long. It probably stays a long, long time in Africa before anyone gets a window. Uh, Again, China is trying to prevent this problem. They, they don't want to be embarrassed by it. Uh, nevertheless, if you have unscrupulous companies that are doing this sort of thing, there's not a lot that they have figured out yet in order to stop it. Perhaps the biggest problem that China is creating in Africa today is that this, this huge amount of cheap Chinese products, manufactured products, entering the African market is undercutting the ability of African companies to succeed, to produce their own products and compete uh, with the imported Chinese products. So you have a lot of, uh, of growing uh, African industries, or trying to grow, that are not succeeding because they simply cannot compete with the cheap imports from China. Uh, this particular issue cuts both ways because African consumers will say, gee, 
you know, the Chinese imports, they're as good as the African-made product, and they're cheaper, so I'd rather buy cheap, not buy African or buy nationalist. So this becomes an issue that's uh, very controversial in Africa with the, uh, the producers of these products very unhappy and the African sellers often unhappy because it's, it cuts them out of a potential job. Uh, but the African consumer saying, ah, oh, no, that's just fine. Uh, those, those cheap sandals, even though they may not last very long, uh, boy, they're half the price of the African made sandal. Uh, there's also, however, an influx of uh, Chinese traders into Africa. These are, it's, it's part of this community that was talked about this morning. And these are, are Chinese who literally come, not necessarily from China, they might be coming from somewhere else in Southeast Asia, some other part of the world. They're hearing that, gee, Africa is a good place to make money. And they set up shop in Africa. They're competing head to head with African traders. And because of their work ethic, perhaps their, <clears throat> their uh, connections back to China with supply sources, they're able to undercut the African trader. And you're getting increasing numbers of African traders who are very unhappy with the Chinese right next, standing right next door to them and in the marketplace who are undercutting their business. And they don't like it. Again, this has a, a separate side to the argument. That is, the African consumer may say, well, that's, you know, that's OK if the if the Chinese trader is selling something that's better or cheaper, uh, I'm more than happy to buy that. And it's too bad that my African counterpart uh, loses out profit or even loses a job. <laughs> now, what does all of this mean? What's the bottom line to, to what China is doing in Africa? A couple of things I think stand up. One, China offers a serious competition and alternative to the West in Africa today. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, African governments, and I underscore governments, almost universally like China's engagement, especially when it comes to uh, a Chinese investment, the foreign direct investment that I talked about, and all of these Chinese concessionary loans. Because the West is not making those loans available. Uh, we just, we don't have the, the fungible capital to do that. Countries that are running large, long-term trade deficits with China, which is the majority of the African countries, are getting a little more concerned about the trade relationship between, between China and, uh, and Africa. And you're starting to hear some complaints, even occasionally public complaints from African leaders about the large uh, trade deficits that seem to be never ending. I'm convinced that China is in Africa for the long term. Uh, Chinese influence will probably increase in Africa, uh, but there is growing competition to the Chinese on the continent. Interestingly, that competition is less from the West and more from countries like India, uh, Brazil, Turkey, Saudi Arabia to some of the, the Gulf states to some extent. Uh, Western countries are still there, they're still active, but they're their role has been rather static in recent years, not particularly growing. And as, um, as China increases its military power, which it clearly is doing, uh, you will see China seeking more formal security relationships with a number of African countries. In other words, the security presence of China is going to grow uh, in Africa. And so far, if you look at everything, you look at the positive and you look at the negative, uh, I would have to conclude that what China, China's engagement in Africa up to the present time has been more positive than it has been negative. Uh, there's plenty to, to measure on both sides of the ledger, uh, but everything considered, I would, um, I would give it a more positive than negative. And let me stop there and be happy to answer any questions you have. And if you want to go further afield than, than China, Africa, and perhaps talk about Africa generally, I'm happy to do that, please. From your own experience, um from your career before your um, academic career. Um, can you give an example of one of the countries that you were in in Africa where maybe you saw this development in China like in the early phases and maybe you look to give whatever example you choose to kind of look at where, what's happening in that country now? Yeah. Uh, a lot of <laughs> much of my, not all of it, but much of my career in Africa was um, during the Cold War. And that was a totally different 
relationship, uh, U.S.-China relationship, than it is today. And it was a totally different Africa-China relationship than you have today. Uh, we were very much competitors. U.S. and China were very much competitors at that point on almost everything. Um, so in terms of my, my own engagement with the African countries, we were looking at China as uh, strictly a, uh, not only a competitor, but a hostile competitor at that time. Now, if you were looking at it from the African point of view, I think they saw, and I, I sort of hate to speak for Africans, I'm obviously not one, but if I can do some interpreting as to what I think, how I think Africans saw China at that time, they, they saw China as an ideological partner in some cases. If you were a, a left-leaning African government, you probably saw China as a put more of a potential partner than perhaps a Western country. If you were a uh, right-leaning or a conservative-leaning African government, you tended to stay away from China and have closer links with the, colon the former colonial power or perhaps even the United States. Uh, because everything was more ideologically focused. And that was what China was doing in the continent uh, at that time. If, if you look at the earlier history of China and Africa, it was, it was heavily political and not economically focused for the simple reason that China didn't have much to offer economically uh, going back to the Cold War period. Uh, they built the, Tanzan the, the Tanzania Zambia Railway, big aid project. Actually, it was an economic failure, but it was a political success, uh, and they get a lot of credit for it, for having carried through with it at a time when they really couldn't afford to pay for something like that, but they did it anyway. Uh, but you, you've had this enormous shift from ideology to a focus on economics, and particularly infrastructure building. Uh, you're starting to see under Xi Jinping a little bit of a shift back towards ideology now. And this is what is very interesting in, in terms of the, the model concept. I mean, the, the book that we wrote that came out in 2012, we stated categorically, a book on China Africa, that China does not see itself as a model for Africa. We were very, very uh, strong on that point. Uh, I couldn't say that today. Uh, I, I think China does see itself as a model, but it will not acknowledge that publicly. I raised it. In fact, they, most people, most Chinese will not even acknowledge it privately. Uh, they will say, well, we have some, there are some things you can learn from us, yes, but we are not a model. That, that's sort of the, the standard uh, Chinese response to that issue. Uh, I'm not sure that that's really what they mean anymore. I think they're seeing themselves more and more as a model. Uh, good morning. Um, you know, there is research that um, when the Chinese have come into Africa, local textile workers are economically displaced. There is the great debt trap debate going on. So I'd like you to speak more on your last point about China being more good than bad for Africa because it sort of smacks of paternalism, which makes me a little uneasy. So um, I think there's a danger in that. So if you could maybe enumerate some things so I could wrestle with what you're saying exactly, because I think paternalism is very, like, ugh, so. Well, you, you're certainly correct on the, the reference to uh, textile, African textile industry losing a lot of its capacity as a result of Asian imports, and not just Chinese imports, but imports from India, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, and other countries. Uh, Africa lost about a third of its entire uh, textile sector this, this goes back about 10 years when most of it shut down because it simply could not compete with the imports from Asia, mainly from China, but not entirely from China. Uh, on the paternalism side, yeah, there's an element of paternalism in this. I, I don't think the Chinese would ever describe it that way. Uh, they, they would not use that term. Uh, but if you look at it in a very hard-nosed kind of way, it, it is uh, fairly maternalistic, paternalistic. Uh, it's, it's also mercantilism. Uh, but you could argue that the United States and, and Europe is, has followed a mercantilist policy towards Africa, too. Uh, I, I'd have to be a little bit careful in criticizing China on that score. Uh, 
if I didn't point out that other major trading powers did essentially the same oh, thing. Oh, absolutely, I agree with you. It's just um, that the point was made about and, and if you want to call that uh, all paternalism, well, yeah, that's, I, I can't really disagree with that. Um, it's, it's just that one has to be a little bit careful about who, who one is criticizing in this regard, because I, I'd be hard pressed to find out almost, or to point out, almost any country that doesn't engage in that kind of policy when you're dealing with developing countries generally, not just Africa, but developing countries generally. It's, it's, a, it's an issue. Uh, but the, the bottom line, the reason I'm saying it's more positive than negative is that what Africa is getting out of this uh, are the, the, the infrastructure projects, which they were not getting from the West because the West was not putting up the capital. But if those infrastructure projects are going to result in what happened in Sri Lanka, where Sri Lanka ended up not being able to repay China for a big port that was being built, China took control of the port, which it now has. Now that, that's not what you want to see happen uh, in Sri Lanka or in, anywhere in Africa. Uh, there is some concern that that could happen in Djibouti, where about 80, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of Djibouti's foreign debt is held by China today, because China is doing all of the, almost all of the infrastructure in Djibouti, and that's where they have their military base. And there's real concern that Djibouti may follow the pattern of Sri Lanka, and that one day Djibouti will go to China and say, oh my goodness, Mr. Xi, we just can't pay you back anymore, uh, we don't have any money, uh, what do we do about it? And Mr. Xi, President Xi says, well, very simple, just give us control of your port. And uh, we'll own it, we'll run it, and um, we'll, that'll be the end of it. Uh, thank you. I was going to ask, of the 53 African nations out of the 54 that um, recognize Beijing, are they all communist governments as well? Oh, no, no. They not, fact, none, none of them. None, 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 none of them are. Then how, what is their rationale for supporting Beijing? The, the rationale for, Beijing? for not, not, not just uh, an African country, but, but virtually any country around the world, like the United States. I mean, we recognize Beijing, and, and we're obviously not a communist country. It, it's the, uh, first it would be, who seems to be in charge of the country? Well, okay, we know who's in charge of the country, and, and, and Xi Jinping and, and the Communist Party of China are in charge, and they, they clearly have more resources available than Taiwan has. Uh, they can offer a lot more. Um, therefore, why would one recognize Taiwan anymore? And only one country does in Africa. I think there are 17 or 18 globally that still recognize Taiwan. But it's, it has nothing to do with there being communist countries. Some of the African countries are, are very democratic and uh, have no ideological sympathy with, what, with the government in China. But they know that's where, where the resources are, that's where the money is, and uh, you, you, go, you go where it is. Please. You stated earlier that the Muslim minorities in Western China, those that are um, uh, being oppressed, um, that the leaders do not touch the issue. My question is, the people that live in the country, um, has there been some, how should I say this, the people that are living in the African nations, um, and that are uh, Muslim, have they been outspoken and have there been issues where these leaders have been called out within their own country? To the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Uh, I, I am not, and, and this is, is what is particularly interesting. Uh, a, a fair number of African countries are members of the Organization of Islamic Conference, the OIC. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've actually talked to some of these religious leaders and said, well, look, um, do you know anything about the, the, the Xinjiang issues and, and the Uyghur issues and yeah, a little bit, not, not an awful lot. Why, you know, you're, you're a religious leader in, in this particular country, why, why don't you deal with this through, uh, your, through the OIC or, or through some organization that you're affiliated with if the government's unwilling to say anything about it. And basically you just get sort of shoulders shrugged and well, we're just not that interested in it. And part of it's lack of knowledge. Uh, the, the Uyghur issue is not well known in Africa. Uh, and that's probably the single most important reason for it. But I know some of these scholars know a lot about it. And they're absolutely silent. They're silent on it. And I don't have a good explanation for it. Uh, 
Do you mean African scholars? African, or? no African scholars. Oh. Yeah. Please. Um, I just want to touch back on something you said before. Now, I agree with all world leaders, you would say, have, um, per, no, they're not all perfect. Yeah, they so have, they're like, not all. World leaders, period, no matter what area, they're not all perfect. But you mentioned something in 2012 about, and I want to touch on Gaddafi, no matter who, or whatever, personal, political. But at that time, there were like six or seven African countries that did not have a centralized bank ranked with the Rothschilds. And Gaddafi was building that in Libya as well as Cameroon. And then during that comes in 2012, when it was on the Obama administration, he was killed. Um, so that would liberate um, Africa to actually import and actually make money off of their own resources through gold and other minerals. Do you know any more about that, or is that something that was talked about through your travels in Africa? I don't, I, yeah. I, I don't know the details of that particular case. I, I would only say that in terms of, uh, of China and, and the Arab countries in Africa and the overthrow of Gaddafi in 2011, it was a very interesting case where there were a number of, of Arab countries that were relatively supportive of the European, essentially U.S. European action to overthrow Gaddafi, and there were most of the African countries were not supportive of that. So you had a difference, something of a difference between the Arab League and the the African Union, or the organization that you know, was the African Union at that point, uh, where their positions were not the same. This put China in a very difficult position because China normally will follow the lead of the. Arab League and the African Union. And when you have a situation like getting rid of Gaddafi, where there's not agreement between those two organizations, China was sort of at, at uh, sixes and sevens as to how to handle this issue. And initially, China kind of went along with the, the Arab, uh, European, American position, and then it backed away from that and decided, no, this was a big mistake. Please. Oh, well, I mean, just to clarify, the, the position of the Chinese supported was just simply the air court. That was, it was simply the, to support basically the suspension of air activities that the NATO was going to yeah. push forward. I think what shocked them, what they were taken aback with as well as the Russians, was the intervention by NATO, the bombing campaign. So yeah. they were operating under that assumption, and I think that's what really colored their approach to Syria also yeah. later on. Now that is, I, it doesn't get to your your more detailed question. No, it addressed question, it. Um, no, it definitely addressed it as far as China. Um, I just feel like um, China is following um, uh, America in the European uh, model. And this is when I was 16. Um, someone from China said to me, "We own the United States," and they meant as far as the financial debt. And uh -huh. it was explained to me that they outwit a lot of. Um, the Europeans, what they're doing in other countries, and so that was just some insight that I got. Um, and well, I just didn't know, have you ever heard those terminology? Because it is, and here it's, it's, it's been told to me from, I mean, people from that particular uh, region in China that they that um, China owns America as far as. Monetary you know, I, I, I mean, the, 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 the sort of grain of truth in that is that there was a point, and I don't think it's true at the moment, but there was a point at which China had held the single largest component of the U.S. bond uh, treasury market. I think today it's back to Japan again. I could be wrong on that. Uh, it's, it's shifted. It's very close between Japan and China. Uh, but the point is that in and of itself does not allow you to own both the United States. It, if, if anything, uh, you've got to be, if you're China, you've got to be careful. You don't want to disrupt that market, or you're going to lose a lot of money in the process. Uh, so I don't think it gives uh, China any claim to ownership whatsoever. Please. Um, it's just at one point we were, we were talking yesterday, too, about some contributions to Africa from China. Um, so you, you, I'm just interested um, the, something like the, the case with. Um, Sudan and the, the allegations in, in, in 2016 that the Chinese um, uh, abandoned their folks. I think they weren't alone in that. Um, and there's some atrocities that were committed. How, how does that kind of a, an event figure in the overall? And I also want to know, we're talking about the allocations to the uh, Department of 
you know, you've heard people speaking and you said that they have the, the largest contribution. I wonder how that's allocated because we understood that in terms of the peacekeeping troops that are that are allocated, is that the discretion of, of uh, PRC? I, 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 or general, whatever country. Well, then let me, let me clarify the financial point first because that's the easiest. In terms of a financial contribution to the UN peacekeeping budget, China provides 10%. The U.S. 28 oh, percent. Okay. So the U.S. is number one, and China is number two. And I mean, 10 percent is pretty significant, but 28 percent is a lot more, obviously. Uh, what China does is that they have more peacekeepers assigned, uh, Chinese peace peacekeepers assigned to African peacekeeping operations than any other single member, as a permanent member of the Security Council. So of the other four members of the Security Council. So it has 2,100 members assigned to African missions at the moment, uh, which is a fairly sizable contribution. Uh, the allocations are decided uh, jointly by the United Nations on the one hand and China on the other. The, the UN puts out a call for uh, how many peacekeepers it needs for a mission, and China will then come forward and say, we will provide 700 to South Sudan or whatever. Uh, so it's a negotiated arrangement. Now also keep in mind that with peacekeeping operations, uh, you're not donating your troops to those activities. Your troops are getting paid. So uh, that applies to all countries, not just China. So China's peacekeepers, uh, money flows back into the, the budget of the government of China. Now presumably it goes to pay the peacekeepers. Who knows what happens to the money? Uh, but there are some countries that probably use the whole peacekeeping operation as a way to pay their troops because they get better salaries in many cases than they would get if they were simply serving their, their own uh, force in the country that they're coming from. So some of the poorer countries like Bangladesh are probably saying, oh boy, this, yes. is, a, this is a real deal uh, to keep our troops employed. Um, yeah, the, the situation in South Sudan that you were alluding to of evacuating the post, I don't know the details of that. Um, are you referring to the time when when the two were killed and two were injured? That's right, two were killed first. I think it was yeah. I, I wasn't they were, like, aware of it. Yeah, I mean, there, there, maybe there's something to abandoning the post. I, I'm just not aware. The, the two who were killed and the two who were injured, you know, just at the wrong place at the wrong time when a mortar shell came in. And these were was these are actually South Sudan government forces shelling the UN base to show how corrupt that government became. Uh, and they, they killed other nationals too, other, uh, other peacekeepers, not just Chinese. Um, but in, in terms of abandoning the post, I don't know. Uh, maybe yeah, I think subsequent to that event, immediately subsequent, um, then it was alleged, uh, and they, I don't think they was totally well in the same care their unit there too, but the Chinese were alleged as having abandoned their posts and just left. left yeah, it, it's possible. Uh, no one has comported themselves very well in that particular peacekeeping operation. It's not been a roaring success. Yeah, that's very helpful. And it's wonderful to have somebody with your expertise on hand. Happy to help. So I go to China. Are you asking for the voluntary? Or I'm sorry. Go to Chinese peacekeepers? Are they voluntary? No, no, no. They're not voluntary. They're assigned uh, by, the, by, the by the government of China. Uh, yeah, and they, they now have a standby. Uh, force of 8,000 uh, who could be assigned to peacekeeping operations around the world. And in theory, they are ready to go anywhere, anytime. But at the moment, you have 2,100 in Africa, and you have, I don't know, five or 600 others in Lebanon, and, and you know, a couple handful in a few other places around the world. So the numbers are not huge. But they're more than what the US does. Of course, the US has. Uh, we don't like to operate under UN command. We want to operate on our own, under our own command. So we have troops all over the place, um, but they're not under UN command. Mm -hmm.